Welcome to our facility here in Papendrecht, the Netherlands. This is a star gazing facility. There is a nice telescope behind, but today we're only going to talk about the revival of Einstein's spherical model of the universe. The, this model is called by us the EMRW model. The E stands for Einstein, M for Minkowski, R and W stands for Robertson Walker. That's a completely new model of the universe. We're going to do away with the old model, which we call the old model, the lambda CDM model, where lambda stands for energy, dark energy, and CDM for cold dark matter. That our model needs no dark energy and no dark matter at all. How we're going to do that? We're going to start with Einstein's original model, original model from 1917. And we're going to revive that based on the principles of Minkowski, Robertson Walker, and Neutron. We've worked on this project for about 15 years, and about 10,000 hours are spent on this between the five of us. We're all present here. There's uh, Oscar, who's an expert in astron astronomical observations. There's Martin, who's taking care of all the articles we make. There's Franz, who is the co-author as well, just as Oscar in the book, and he's specialized in differentiation techniques. Hank, who's always supervising things and things of, think of neuter, think of energy conservation. And that's our group, which meets monthly such that we can update each other. Uh, we have support from two mathematicians. They're not available here, they're not here. Uh, Case and Albert, who have really helped us with the complicated mathematics of some of the physics. And we have unsolicited help from three universities. We're going to see data provided by the University of Amsterdam. We're going to see data provided by the, the Yonsei University. And we have some support from the University of, Amst uh, of Leiden. Amsterdam, I mentioned, and of Leiden. So we have a lot to tell. The first thing we'll do is look at the errors or the problems as we see them of the current model. So we're going to look at the first problem of the FLRW model. FL stands for Friedman and Lemaitre. RW stands for Robertson Walker. So in this current model, they claim they also make use of Robertson Walker's co-moving coordinates. And they're key issue of this existing model is, is 96% of the universe dark? That is quite a claim. 96% of the universe dark. Do the physicians know from which particles that dark energy and matter exists? No, they don't. Do we have measuring equipment somewhere in the world of dark matter? Yes, we have. In Italy, in Italy, under the Gran Sasso, there's a facility where they're trying to find dark matter, and the last three years they found absolutely nothing. So we're in this way supported by the physicians that there is no existence of dark energy and dark matter. Dark energy and dark matter is only living in the minds of cosmologists, and I hope you join me in taking that out again. The authors, what we say, no, the lambda CDM model is based on the Hubble law. The Hubble law is a big part of this presentation. What's wrong with the Hubble law? Which assumes that speed is the only cause of redshift. We'll talk about what redshift is. And we will say, no, there are other causes. There are other causes of redshift, like gravitation, as Einstein figured out. And another cause of redshift is cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation is relatively new. That's promoted by Alan Guth. And cosmic inflation and what it is, it is essentially observing a faster clock in the past. We're going to talk about all these things later. First, let's see how we can promote and support the statement that is 96% of the universe dark, that it is not the case. So that's out. And the evidence comes from the Yonsei University. They have released a 
press release just on the 5th of January of this year. So this is very recent information. What do they state? New evidence shows that the key assumptions made in the discovery of dark energy is in error. Is in error. Let me be very clear about it. They basically state, that's very academic like to say it's so hard, but they say dark energy is in error. How they conclude that is they have looked at high precision age dating. Age dating from supernova is maybe not familiar to everyone, but they clearly state that high precision age data of supernova host galaxies reveals that the luminosity evolution of supernovae is significant enough to question the very existence of dark energy. How do these luminosity evaluations go? They have a certain pattern with more and less luminosity. Luminosity is something that astronomers can measure well. The luminos luminosity evolution is that this kind of graph. If dark energy would exist, and that's based on the Hubble law, the further away the galaxy is, the longer it would take before that whole cycle is done. And they have pretty much by observation proven that that is not the case. And therefore, they state that the whole idea of dark energy is in error. That's the first part of supporting evidence. The second problem of the current model, the FLRW model, is does photon energy get lost in the universe? As physicians, you'll always say, no, energy doesn't get lost. The total of energy always has to stay the same. So how can photon energy get lost? Well, in the current model of FLRW, when photons are transmitted at the surface of last scattering, that is very long ago era, which we now receive as the cosmic background radiation, at that time the temperature must have been about 3000 degrees Kelvin. How do we know if on Earth we heat up uh, hydrogen and helium to 3,000 degrees Kelvin, then it suddenly becomes misty. And the cosmic background radiation is as far as we can look. That is then transmitted, therefore, at a time it must have been 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Over that temperature, it becomes misty and we can't look any further. So we know the temperature, we know via the Planck law what the highest energy of what the energy of the photons at the peak is. That's a very low amount of joules, but that it is. If it's then received on Earth, photons received on Earth as the cosmic background radiation, we see a temperature of only 2.725 degrees. That is an awful lot lower than the almost 3,000 degrees it was transmitted. And the same thing for the energy of the photon at the peak of reception, that is also much, much smaller. In fact, in effect, we measure 1,093 times as little as it was transmitted, both in Kelvins as in the Joules at of the peak photons. How come? Well, in the FLRW, they just say, OK, the, the wavelength is stretched. But stretching a wavelength means less energy, so taking away energy. Where does that energy then go? So, according to this model, this existing model, 99%, that's 1, in 19, 1 divided by 93, short of 100%, is lost during the trip from the SLS to Earth, according to this model. Does energy get lost? No. Energy loss of photons is impossible, both according to Einstein and according to Emmy Neutron. Emmy Neutron has become famous for her theorems of energy conservation and momentum conservation. So, and Einstein said, photons don't change. The proper time of photons, that's the time if you were traveling along with photons, does not change. A photon 
if the time stands still, that's effectively what it does, it is like a sleeping beauty going through our cosmos, then nothing changes. It can't change, it can't change in energy terms at all. So both Einstein and Plato say, no, 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 photo energy does not get lost. So that's a serious weakness of the FLRW problem. You might ask, what are we saying about that then? We are saying, it's in the units. Maybe you can remember from early university that the physics professor told you, think of the units, think of the units, think of the units. In other words, the problem might be with the units. Are the units, Joule and Kelvin, the same units as they were very long time ago? Well, I ans our answer is no. These units, these cosmic units, are, were then 1093 times as small as these are now. Oh, well, you can't quite see that, but in this box it says 1093 to 1, and here it says 1 to 1093. So the product of coordinate and unit is exactly the same then as it is the product of coordinate and unit now. Then the units were 1093 times as small as these are now. That goes for the Kelvin, that goes for the Joule, and later we'll also see that that goes for the meter, according to Robertson Walker's co-moving coordinates, and also according to the second. So all the basic units are, at the time of the SLS, 1093 times as small as these are now. That doesn't mean that physics was different at the time, but, diff but the physics went on a different pace. It looks to us, it went 1,093 times as fast then, it, but if you lived at the time, it seemed quite normal. That's something that Einstein definitely proved 100 years ago. So, we're now going to go in some more detail about the our EMRW model of the universe. It is just a model, to be clear. Huh? We need to make models of the universe because cosmological principle that we'll talk about makes certain assumptions. Let's first look at what Einstein said, because the E of Einstein here is the universe is a three-sphere in space. A three-sphere is quite a complicated mathematical figure. In short, we'll talk about it later, but in short, it's the surface of a four-dimensional hypersphere. It's our normal space, but Einstein figured out that in order to have a good model, every location must be the same, and every location must be the same in all directions. So the revival of Minkowski, we've already hinted at it, Minkowski was his teacher. He said, well, uh, space and time fade away into some kind of union. So by using Minkowski, we're going to change this three-sphere from a space model into a space-time model. Robertson Walker effectively said that the coordinates, the length, the distances, and those kind of things, move along with the expansion of the universe. That's the essence of co-moving coordinates. It moves along with the expansion of the universe. But we say, hey, wait a second, if that automatically means that your meter has to stay, has to grow along instead of your coordinate. Only then you can have co-moving coordinates. So with Robertson Walker, we're going to state now, make this a general statement, all physics must work in co-moving coordinates. And then, as most important part, Emmy Neuter with her theorems must then automatically conclude that energy is conserved in co-moving coordinates. We go, go over all these things in more detail, but that's the generic story. We're going to do that in three chapters. First, Hubble. Hubble discovered the relationship between distance d and redshift z. But he assumed speed 
to be the only cause for redshift of galaxies. And we will show you later that cosmic inflation is a larger uh, cause of cosmic redshift. In chapter two, we're going to look at that Einstein model, see what that is, what is the three sphere, and how can we uh, make that visible. And in the last chapter, we're going to put time to this model. We're actually going to see that the radius, the four dimensional radius of this funny hypersphere, this three sphere, is a function of time. So, this is where time comes in. Chapter 1, we're now going to look at galaxy GN Z11. That is galaxy number Z11. Z stands for redshift. And this is a picture that comes from the University of Leiden, of which they are very proud of, because this is the farthest galaxy we've ever seen and ever measured. What you see here, what you see here, that is that galaxy GN Z11. It's zoomed in. It is zoomed in, and what you see here are all other galaxies. They're not stars, they're all galaxies. And that's all within a one arc second, 60th of a 60th of a degree. And here you see how, how nice a picture this is, that you can get such an accurate picture on such a small scale. This is the farthest galaxy at redshift. 11, and therefore they've called it GNZ11, that is self-explanatory. Uh, but the essence is that it is recorded with the Hubble Space Telescope Advanced Cosmological Studies Wide Field Camera Number 3 Infrared. So this is taken up, taken by an infrared camera. So what you see here is an infrared picture. What you see here is white used to be at uh, transmission and broadcasting gamma rays, high energy gamma rays and x-rays. What you see here as red were originally, the, it was originally the white light of the, uh, is the white light of the uh, galaxy itself. So this is the center of the galaxy and this is a number of stars around it. Here you see what redshift is. Normal light color gets infrared and gamma rays become white. The red has shifted. It's shifted to the red. Redshift 11 is the most extreme measurement of a galaxy we've ever seen. And Leiden should be proud of that. But that is the essence of redshift. Um, we have more information about galaxies at a lower redshift. Redshift around 9. And that's what the NASA and ESA have said about this. They say Hubble finds hundreds of young galaxies in the early universe. That's the article that you can still find on the NASA ESA website. The findings also show that these dwarf galaxies were producing stars at a furious rate, about 10 times faster than is happening now in nearby galaxies. Now, nearby is not quite that nearby. It's, let's say, two and a half million light years from us. But we're now talking about serious distances, much closer to the cosmic horizon. And what is noticed is that these galaxies with a redshift of around nine produce stars at a furious rate, ten times faster. Now, if you ask, if you ask, the Hubble law, the Doppler effect, which is both in the FLRW model, then you should see this star formation 10 times slower. It is like, it is like a high-speed train in France passing a very small train station where it's not going to stop. That high-speed train, to warn the people at the station that the train is coming, sends out every second a tone of, let's say, 5,000 hertz. When it comes towards you on the station, that one second peep at 5,000 hertz is not heard at every second and at 5,000 hertz, but it's a higher pitch. It's double the pitch if you go by half of the speed of sound. So it, it is received as 1,000 hertz. And more important, the interval between peeps is only heard half a second. 
Why? Of course, the train comes closer than its time, it's got less travel times, so you only hear that half, every half a second. The other way around, when a train is passed, you're not going to hear the 5000 hertz anymore, you hear the lower tones, the 2500 hertz, and you hear the signal every two seconds. So the real physics of one second for the conductor becomes for the people at the train station, when the train has passed, two seconds, it goes slower. So, in the same reasoning, if galaxies disappear from us, everything should move slower. In effect, it should move ten times slower when you observe it. Not, of course, when you're there, but when you observe it. What do we say? Ah, this is not because of speed, this is because of cosmic inflation. Simply, the time went quicker at that time as we observe it. So, in our model, star formation observation should be 10 times faster, corresponding exactly to this observation of NASA and ESA. So redshift Z of 9 gives you 10 times faster star formation observation. A very important and powerful support to our theory that speed is not the main cause of redshift for far galaxies, but that cosmic inflation is. Now you understand what the cosmic inflation is. Things look to go much faster than you think they go. Conclusion, we must come to the conclusion that the redshift set of far, far galaxies is not caused by speed alone, but mainly caused by cosmic inflation of redshift plus what? bit more about the cosmic inflation itself, what it is. We've just said it is we observe clocks in the past ticking faster. It's an observational issue, just like the Doppler effect is an observational issue. Cosmologists like Alan Guth theorized fast expansion of the universe very long ago. They, he called that the cosmic inflation era. This is a statement of about 20 to 25 years ago. He's won some prizes for that statement. He has proven that the universe must have developed at a very high pace very long ago. The clock progressed very fast in that era. And that means a very small unit second. If your unit second is very small, it is observed to go really fast if you have a slower second where you observe. The second point is Robertson Walker. Robertson Walker did something similar. They say the universe expands, but the coordinates of the galaxies go with it. So the coordinate stays the same, it's just the unit meter that expands. If, and now we get to Emmy Neuter again, Emmy Neuter is, uh, says what you need to do to ensure energy conservation. To ensure energy conservation, you must have the same physics over time and you must have the same constants of nature over time. In other words, to ensure energy conservation, the speed of light has to remain the same over time. The speed of light then must have been the same as the speed of light now. And if you say that and the meter gets larger, then the second must get larger too, because Speed is, meet, is measured in meters per second. So we now have four units that all become larger over time, or if you look back in the past, are shorter and smaller units. In other words, the conclusion, the conclusion is, if, uh, don't do that wrong. The conclusion is, the farther you look, the more you look in the past, and events like star formation are observed to go faster. That is cosmic inflation, redshift plus one. So we have to look at the Hubble law. How could the Hubble law get it so wrong? Let's look at the Hubble data of 1929. In 1929, that was the first time Hubble looked at galaxies. He said, okay, I put my velocity here because I know that velocity is a cause of redshift. We're not arguing with that, that is correct. 
but he put two speeds up there. That's the local speed and the expansion speed. So what you see here, this line is the expansion line as he thought it was, and it is the good line, but he assumed that the cause of that was only speed of expansion. In other words, the further you look, the higher the distance, therefore, yes, the higher the distance, then the faster the galaxies goes. So GM Z11, the galaxy we've just seen, must be speeding near the speed of light away from us. That's what Hubble assumed. And he, the relation he thought it was, was that relationship. So, by adding the expansion speed to the local speed, you get the recession speed. Here you see the recession speed against distance. When he started this investigation, he got the help from Mr. U. Mason. And Hubble and U. Mason made, uh, gave, uh, uh, published a report in 1931 on larger distances. And they were so convinced that it was speed that they even put the fact that the redshifts are expressed on the scale of velocities is incidental. Well, that is not very scientific to say that the things are that you measure redshift and that you put it down as velocities. And to show you that, well, let's look at the real document. This is the original document of Hubble and Humes. This is page 73. And here you see that incidental. The fact that the redshifts are expressed in, say, is incidental. For the present purpose, they might just as well be expressed as, and that is redshift. That is a scientific way of, of describing redshift. So, this redshift was measured, and this was assumed, assumed an expansion velocity. What was really measured was the redshift, that is redshift, therefore that's in green, and this is an assumption. The relation found by Hubble, these redshift and these distances, that's the relation he found, or they found. And by interpreting, by interpreting the expansion speed, you get the wrong conclusion. So, that is Hubble's assumption, assuming its local speed and distance, he, he made estimate distances just like we did with the supernovae, that can also be done with the c variables in galaxies, and we cannot conclude any other thing than this is what he should have written now, Hubble's measurements, those are the real measurements, that's basic physics, basic technology and science. So, out goes that assumption, this is what it should have been. Now we're going to introduce our Hubble law. We're going to change the Hubble law, call it the advanced Hubble law, and that looks like that. That's the advanced Hubble law in which the effects of speed are still there. Speed is a cause of redshift, but also the distance as was measured by Hubble and Humason themselves. So that is the reverse formula. Sorry, that goes too fast. That is what Hubble should have put down, and which is very close to that one. If, if that is smaller than the speed of light, then that is a good measurement, and that would be the initial measurement of cosmic inflation by Hubble and Humes. So, in summary, our advanced Hubble law combines the effect of local speed, the Doppler effect, and distance, cosmic inflation, into one formula, proven by star formation, and proven by other things as well, we'll get to. Let's take M87. M87 is a galaxy that's become very familiar lately, because they find the most massive black hole they've ever found in M87. M87 is not that very far away, because it has a redshift of just 0.00428. You see, that's much less than the 11 and 9 we talked about before. But at this smaller distance, this distance of 16.8 megaparsec, and one parsec is the one about three light years, 
So this is about 55 million light years away, this galaxy. At that distance, that redshift, and likely no local speed. Why do I say that? Because this is an extremely massive galaxy. The more massive galaxies you find in the universe, the lower their own speed is. And especially M87, because it's in the middle of the galaxy, so you don't expect any speed from there. The only speed left here is our own speed, the speed of the sun in the universe for measuring redshift. But if we just take, oh, uh, go wrong again here. If we just go the speed on zero, we can suddenly get the Hubble constant computed by this formula, where this is zero. We can then back compute the Hubble constant, which comes very close to estimates of about 15, 20 years ago of the Hubble uh, constant in different methods. So, if you still believe that Hubble is right, the Hubble law is right, the expansion is h times d, then the Hubble law would result in a combined local and expansion speed of 1,283 kilometers per second. And what do you need to get up to speed? You need energy. And an additional problem for the Hubble law is, if your distance gets larger because of that speed, Tomorrow it's even further away and the speed is even higher. So you get an accelerated speed according to the Hubble law. An and an acceleration takes not just energy, but it takes ever increasing dark energy. Where is that energy coming from? That's not up to us, that's their statement, and we just cross out this whole Hubble law as it stands. And I hope you'll agree that this is a much better law that is called then by us the advanced Hubble law. Let's go back for a second to that galaxy ZM11, GNZ, uh, GNZ11, redshift of 11 that is substantial and let's assume it has no speed. If it's the only one in that area you don't expect there are a lot of speed of this galaxy. And let's assume the Hubble constant H of 76 based on the M87 standing still. We then get to a distance, and this distance formula, yeah, it looks horrific, but this is the reverse of the advanced Hubble law, except that the distance now is on the left-hand side. If you go by speed zero, you get this. And Martin has uh, checked that for me, that is perfectly okay. You then get to this formula for the distance and this, this GNZ11 is at a distance of almost 12 billion light years from us. Or it, if you look at this term, this is also called the Hubble distance or the cosmic horizon. That's how far you could possibly see because of the limited speed of light. The cosmic horizon of CH is about 13 billion light years. That was the estimate of 10 to 15 years ago. Anyway, you could better express the distance as a percentage, as a percentage of that cosmic horizon, then you get the relative distance to the cosmic horizon. So you can see how far on your, it is away from the horizon you could possibly see. So this one is the farthest galaxy we've ever uh, discovered, that's that GNZ11 is at 92% of the cosmic horizon. Keep this formula in mind because we'll need that later. Conclusion, no need for dark energy, no need for increasing dark energy, no speed, but cosmic inflation. To set that graph here, such that we can see how what Hubble actually, how Hubble fits in this picture. This is the graph of the cosmic inflation, and that's that distance, that's that redshift is, uh, sorry, that distance percentage is redshift, which you find there. There's the redshift. Uh, redshift divided by redshift plus one. So, um, if we take, for example, a supernova, that's the supernova the Chinese have used, they used the supernovae 
to, uh, to estimate distance. So here you see redshift 2, and that comes to 2 divided by 3 at 66% of the horizon. So we immediately know that it is at 66% of our cosmic horizon. Of course, the Milky Way is there, the final horizon is there. And there we have the farthest galaxy, and that is then at 92% of the cosmic horizon. What did, uh, when is speed important? Speed is important on this very beginning, in this very low area of distance, where the redshifts are zero or around zero, could even be negative. And when is the cosmic inflation dominant? When is that the main cause? That is the main cause when you get into this area. I'm going too quick again, sorry. Hubble, uh, sorry, this is the cosmic, uh, cosmic inflation main cause, the same formula as we've seen. And what Hubble measured in 1931 was this, and this is again a good approximation of that. So effectively, Hubble measured cosmic inflation unwittingly, because in the day he did his work in 1931, nobody knew what cosmic inflation was. Cosmic inflation is something of this century. Okay, now we get to conclusions, and after conclusions you can ask any questions about this part. Observations of galaxies at redshift 9 indicate cosmic inflation to be the main cause of redshift, not the speed of expansion. That differs a factor 100 from each other. Each other. So instead of 10 times, it's 10 times faster instead of 10 times slower. Clear evidence. Cosmic redshift is caused both by local speed and distance of galaxies. The effect of distance comes from the observed fast block cosmic inflation. The advanced Hubble law is a distance ladder for all distances, fitting all of the redshift observations of galaxies, including the original ones of Hubble and Rumais. In other words, universe is expanding in the basic units, second meter kilogram column. Those are the co-moving coordinates of Roberts and Walker. All physics is in co-moving coordinates. That means, and it's important to emphasize, the highly redshifted galaxies do not speed away from us, but say, stay at about the same relative distance, and of course, apart from local speed. Now this might be a good time for questions. Has anyone got questions about this first part? Yeah, from the part. I uh, heard that uh, the H, uh, the Hubble constant, changes over time. In the formulas, you use a special um, H of 17, 76. 76 yeah. uh, in coordinates, in the co 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 moving coordinates, yeah. that Hubble constant is constant. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, the, uh, the, the difference, that's a very interesting question, Franz. Why is, because the, the other model, the FLRW model, talks about a varying Hubble constant. Now, that is right against Emmy Noether's theory of energy conservation. To conserve energy must have constant constants. Constants of nature need to be the same, the laws of nature need to be the same. So we are bound by constant Constants. It's, the word says it constant. It's a bit funny that they make use of a variable constant. The problem for the FLRW model is that they have to mix and match such that it works. And if it doesn't work, they have to adapt some, do some adaptions, and they've used the Hubble constant as a varying one to make those adaptions. So, yes, uh, FLRW has invariable constants and the Hubble constant is one of them, just to make the thing work. But it's it's a house of cards in which you make funnier conclusions every time you look at them. Okay, thanks. Any and, other questions? And this Noether you mentioned. Yeah. Who who is Noether? Was that someone? Yeah, Emmy Noether is, is 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 an amazing story. Emmy Noether was a bit younger than Einstein. Uh, she lived in the same time as Einstein lived in Germany. 
in the wrong time, in the wrong place. A woman scientist in Germany of around 1920 was not a very good place to be. Emmy Noether was a brilliant mathematician, and she has, his, she, you could call her the mother of physics because she looked at something important like energy conservation and momentum conservation and what the conditions are to get that. Because she was a woman, because she was a Jew, because it was not nice to be in Germany at that time, she was totally ignored. She was called by Einstein D. Neuter. Uh, by, we don't need to talk about her. Had Einstein listened to, fully listened to Emmy Neuter, he would have changed his relativity at some places. I'm not saying that Einstein's relativity is worthless, definitely not. But some things can be adjusted such that it could be fulfilling Noether's theorems. And on energy conservation, it's especially important because we're talking here about the Robertson Walk co-moving coordinates. Especially there, energy conservation is a key to us. So if energy conservation is any of your liking, like we all do, then you must go by the theorems of Emmy Noether. And we had to adapt the Robertson-Walker solution they came first up, up with, such that it does agree with Emmy. Is that answering your question? Yeah. Okay, we're now going to go to the second chapter, the difficult shape that Einstein thought of, that he presented in his book, My Theory. And uh, here you see the Dutch version of that book, if I can find it. That's the book, My theory in the cosmological section you'll find that three sphere described very nicely by Einstein. It is the logical shape of the universe according to the cosmological principle. Remember that cosmological principle says the model of the universe must be the same everywhere and the same in all directions. What is the problem with the normal sphere? A normal sphere has a midpoint and an end. And unless you think that the Earth is the midpoint of the universe, the cosmologists say, no, every location is the same. And that is the cosmological principle. That's fundamental cosmology. So we're going to look at Einstein's model now. We have to talk about space-time now and four dimensions and all those difficult things. If you take a coin, of one euro from five meters, five meter height, and you drop it, then, and you put the time axis there, then this is a space-time graph. Here it's on the floor, and here is time progressed one second, and here the height has gone down from five to zero. This is a simple space-time diagram, but it's only in two dimensions. If you now say, I want four dimensions pictured. Well, here you have a picture. It's x, y, z, n, t in one graph. But can you see that this is perpendicular to that, perpendicular to that, and perpendicular to that? No, of course not. You can't imagine four dimensions. We humans cannot imagine four dimensions. And that's the subject for this chapter. Essence to don't worry about Imagining it, just think of 2D sections only. So think of how do you go and where do you end. Take a trajectory, take a route. And uh, if you look at the logic about Einstein's three sphere, what is the original one in 1970? What must Einstein have thought? He must have had some logic. He thought, ah, universe is limited. At that time, everyone was convinced that the universe was limited in space. If it was unlimited, then all the stars from old, from infinity till here, would all light up the sky permanently, and it would be light at night. It would be very much light at night. And therefore, they, most of them concluded the universe must be limited in space. The second thing is the cosmological principle. It must be the same everywhere, the same in all directions as we discussed. The third one is another one that's very important now, although Einstein couldn't know that at the time. 
but that's an important reasoning now. The background radiation comes from all sides. Now, can you imagine that according to the previous model, the universe has been this big at one point in time, but the background radiation comes from all sides. How can something so small, so far away, come from all sides? That can only be in a spherical situation. That can only be seen here if it comes from all sides, because we are in a spherical universe. And light curves around Mars. So the idea that light goes straight on is simply not right. In the universal scale, light bends, light curves, which Eddington proved in 99 for starlight around the sun, for example. So, Einstein conclusion, the universe must be limited but without borders. If there are borders, you have edges, then you can't fulfill the cosmological principle. So my model of the universe is curved like the surface of a globe. Here you see that globe, here is this globe. There is no midpoint of the surface of the Earth. There's a midpoint of the Earth, of course, in 3D, but on the surface itself there is no midpoint, there is no edge. It's a limited surface and there is no midpoint of the surface itself. So, my model of the universe is curved like the surface of a globe, but one dimension higher. I'm going to look at one dimension higher. So, the three sphere is mathematically the three dimensional curved surface of a four dimensional hypersphere. To make that understand, in Einstein's model, this surface is equals the 3D space we live in. It's just X, Y, Z, as we're used to, three directions. That is the surface. Except that if you go in that direction in the universe, you'll end up from there back. If you go in that direction, you end there back. And if you go in that third direction, you end up there. That is very similar to the surface of the Earth, one dimension lower. And here you can see how important it is to think of 2D sections. In that way you can understand what happens. Although we can't understand how you can get in circles if you go that way. Illustrated one dimension lower, you see the 2D ends crawling over the 2D surface, which is limited, borderless, homogeneous and isotropic. Exactly what he was looking for. If you want to read more about these kind of shapes, read the book Flatland, written by Abbott. Einstein's original three-sphere in 2D section. So here we see the 2D section. That is the 2D section of the four-dimensional three-sphere that Einstein was talking about. Here we see the GNZ11 again. And that light goes all the way along this circle to Earth. That's the route we're taking in two-dimensional sections. Our cosmic horizon is here, of course, exactly at the other count. And Einstein universe is limited, but without borders. The logic we've seen, we're not going to talk about that again. We're just going to add the formula for the mathematicians. This is the formula you're talking about for a three-sphere. X, X, well, you can read it yourself. The important thing is the radius, the four-dimensional radius. So the three-sphere of Einstein is a surface, but it still has a radius, and that radius is a four-dimensional radius in normal meters. That is Einstein's three-sphere in a 2D section. Now, you might ask, how do you know you're in a three-sphere? What can you do? Therefore, we're going to look at the ends on the surface of the Earth. What we're going to do is counting cities between 15 degrees latitude apart. Here you see the end, and n is going to go counting cities. What happens, more and more cities are counted, the greater distance class you get into. And you get to the maximum number of cities counted at the equator there. So you see that those numbers are higher around the equator, and then go down again so farther away, less and less cities are counted and not around the South Pole. 
conclusion, a 2D creature, and that's an important conclusion that Gauss took uh, more than 100 years ago. He says, yes, as 2D creature, you can know that you live in a 3D curved space by just doing this. And it can even compute the three-dimensional radius. So you are a flatlander, but you can still compute the three. How do you do? You take the longest distance, the distance from the North Pole to South Pole, and you divide that by pi. Then you know the un understandable radius, three-dimensional radius, if you are a flat lander. Now we're going to do similar things for the galaxy, of course. One step back, that counting, you saw the counting to be like that, more, more, more till the equator, and less, less, less going to the south. We've now done it in 100 steps, so that's the 100 steps you're seeing here. If the Earth was flat, the counting would be very different. You see more and more and more and more cities the further away, because if you assume that the same number of cities is on the same surface. So by looking, by counting cities or by counting galaxies, as we're going to do, you can decide whether you are four-dimensionally curved or not. So, this is done. What you actually get is last step. You have the surface of the Earth, assuming that on the same surface there's the same number of cities, you get a graph which is, should be at least similar. In this case, you see on, in the south, you see less cities than in the north side of our Earth. Doing that for galaxies, we need a galaxy count. And thanks to the University of Amsterdam, we have a galaxy count. What does it show you? It shows you here intervals of 0.2 redshift. This is the redshift in 0.2 intervals. Here you see the number of galaxies per square arc minute. That is quite a narrow band. And you still see here between 0.8 and 1 redshift, you go to that part, you see an average of 75 galaxies. And so you see how many galaxies there are in the universe. The point is that that goes up and up and up, and it goes down, down, down. And the formula the University of Amsterdam has chosen is that formula. That formula will come back in our further slides. So, again, we're going to count galaxies this time, here the Milky Way. And here you have the cosmic horizon with GNZ11 almost on the other side. If the universe is three-sphere, is a three-sphere Einstein believed, it should be like this. If it is Euclidean, that should go up and up and up. The further you look, the more galaxies you would count. And as you can see, that comes very close to each other. This is the volume of a three-sphere, eh? that's the three-dimensional surface of the hypersphere, and this is the count according to that formula of the University of Amsterdam. See how close it is. That the other graph on the Earth was the same is no coincidence because it's the <laughs> same graph. <laughs> but the essence is that at redshift one, you see the most galaxies per percentage distance. That is the essence, and this is the proof that Einstein was absolutely right to assume this long before they could count galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we know we have a three-sphere according to Einstein. It's not a space-time sphere yet, so before we can go to make it, this is a good time for questions. I think you had a question uh, case earlier. Uh, I, I said earlier that in the light of what you told us, uh, what is the, uh, of the universe, the age? The age of the universe and the expansion of the universe. Okay, and the, and the expansion of the yes. universe. Yes, well, at this point, it's important to realize that Einstein, when he saw the work of Hubble and Mason, said, okay, my model is wrong, and he left this model. That's why we call it the revival of Einstein's model of the universe. He left it because, oh, he thought, I don't need that cosmological constant, that dark energy. We could have done with speed alone. That's what he thought. 
So the problem of the Hubble animation assumed expansion of the universe is also the problem with Einstein's original model because time isn't in there. So to answer your question, uh, the age of the universe is something that my first question would in which units, in which units. And do we talk about the units of today? Do we talk about the units of before? So before we can answer this question, we have to get into the time part of this space-time model EMRW. So let's, I think we first should go to the time part for I can fully answer your question. So we're now going to look at Minkowski. And what Minkowski said is that space and time fade away in some kind of a union. The three-sphere space-time radius R4 is a function of t. We're going to say the radius of this three-sphere is time. Is time. It's a function of time. It's one and the same thing. They relate via one formula. And that is what we're going to do. So let's introduce time in Einstein's model of the universe. This is Einstein's model as it stands in space. You see the same space formula, the same circle in 2D section. And now we're going to go and revival space to space time. So now we're going to include time in this picture. This circle is still the same now, except that the past is now inside and the future is outside and our horizon is there. So this is the far part. G and Z11 is there now, but it used to be there. And the light has actually gone in this way to Earth. So we have here a radius, a four-dimensional radius, and we here have time. And what is the relationship? Now, just like the ends, you can remember, divided by P, here we see it again. The four-dimensional radius is the same as the speed of light times time divided by pi. Simple as that. It is then in, and now back to the units, it's then assuming the unit meter is the same meter now. Of course it isn't, but it's just to make this picture that you can't draw in changing units you must standardize on one specific unit to make these kind of pictures. And we standard on the meter of the year 2000. In astronomy, it's a good habit to standardize on things that have been, that, how they were in the year 2000, so you don't get confusing about times and distances. So that is there. And to um, complete, complete this, we say we live surrounded by space, we live surrounded by space, we have space in three dimensions around us, but on the edge of time, we are live now and now only. In a space-time model, you must understand that we're on the edge. This is the edge. The past is within, the future is outside of it. So, if your kids ever ask you, what is there outside of the universe? You say, outside of the universal space-time is the future. You have got the future. You will live tomorrow outside of your universe of today. I still owe you the summary of it. The summary of why do we think that our model is so much better than the FL, FLRL model. No dark energy, dark matter. I'll get to that, back to that in a second. Universe is three, proven by galaxy distribution. It's not just a wild model, it's proven by galaxy distribution. Minkowski adds time to it, and Robertson Walker, time in co moving coordinates, proven by fast star formation. That's that cosmic inflation. And Neuter, we know that the universal energy is conserved in co moving coordinates. So, the last thing to do is to put that conserved energy in a formula. This is the conserved amount of energy. This is the formula, speed of light to the power of 5, divided by G and divided by H, the Hubble constant. Or, for those that want to see it in co-moving joules, is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 70 joules. That is the conserved energy. That is the case today, that is the case tomorrow, and that was the case 10 billion years ago, or actually 
50 billion years ago. And that comes back to your question case. I'll have to look at Dick. Uh, sorry, Dick. <laughs> we began the right case. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Sorry, Dick. Uh, this is your question, but we were going to. Uh, yeah, you wanted to see how the universe expands. That was your question, Dick. Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, that is how you look at it in the units. If you look at it at constant units, if you now do as if the unit meter is fixed, don't forget tomorrow the meter is also expanding, just like everything else, it's a, it's a physical thing. Uh, so, but if you had constant meters 2000 here, then the expansion of the universe continues forever, but slower and slower. That is if you measure in constant units. Constant units don't exist. The units are part of our physics. The units grow with us, so we have co-moving. So the next thing to state, the expansion in co-moving coordinates is not, there is no expansion. So therefore my question, what units are you talking about? If you're talking about the units of today, which are different from the units of tomorrow, then you get an expansion, and the expansion goes slower and slower. That's a logarithmic function that will never stop. Our expansions will continue forever. In real physics, in measurement terms, there is no expansion. Then about the age, quite by coincidence, I've got this prepared for you. Um, in age, the age in constant unit second, again, the second of the year, year 2000, is then 1 divided by h, that's the Hubble time, in 2000 uh, standard units, plus, of course, the second since 2000. So we're gradually going that way in constant units, and we're now living in the future in this model. Or, if you say no, h on the cesium clock, that is where the logarithmic function bites. That means that the age on a real clock, a clock would have started at any point in time, would always point at infinity, because that's an, uh, the consequence of having a shorter, shorter second in the past relative to us, that you can go on forever. It's a kind of horizon. I'll get to that. The age in co-moving coordinates stays the same age. It is tomorrow the same age it is today, except that the second tomorrow is larger than today. So from measurement perspective, it is large. This is the cosmic horizon that we're talking about. We're not having a Big Bang, we're having a Hubble horizon. If you could travel back in time, let's say you travel back in time 10 billion years, you can't, and you cannot travel back in time, but if you could, and you asked the, the, uh, the academics then how long ago is the Big Bang? They say, oh, that's still uh, 13 uh, billion years ago. And if you then go back 10 billion, they keep saying it's like, it's like a ship at sea. You see a barrel at the horizon. You go to that barrel. You pick up the barrel, but you've noticed that the horizon has moved just as far as it always was. So therefore, we'd like to call that horizon, the Hubble horizon, in honor of the good work that Hubble has done. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Are, are, yeah. there, are there more persons in, in, uh, in the world uh, that say there is no big bank? Not many. Not many. Not, not people with a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> There's no group like your group. Uh, there are a few scattered around the world, but uh, we've not been in contact yet. Okay. This is a pretty unique story, um, as far as I know. If you find anything like that, I'd love to hear that. But this is a very unique story. It, uh, it is against all the things all students of cosmology learn, like this famous book, Foundation of Modern Cosmology, which is kind of the, the handbook for cosmologists. Uh, in here you see things like 
energy conservation should not be worried about. And I mean, if you don't believe it, you can check that here. Here is the whole page that says why, why energy conservation is a local question only. We are strong believers that energy doesn't suddenly appear or disappear. We believe in energy conservation. That's the basis of our story. And what did you say in a uh, university like Leiden uh, of your theory? Uh, they uh, uh, prefer not to answer. <laughs> no, they don't. It's, it's not good for anyone's reputation to go along with a little independent uh, thinking think tank that wants to think differently. That's, mm -hmm. that's I don't know, that's our fate, I guess. Uh, to come up with something totally new is, uh, is throwing away a lot of investments and a lot of copy-paste. Martin? Yeah, I have a question. You said uh, totally new, but in fact, when I understand it correctly, in cold moving coordinates, the universe is stable. Yeah. And you told that Einstein thought that the universe is stable. So yeah. in fact, it's not so new at all. In fact, you are going back to the, how to say, the idea of Einstein himself. Well, there, there are, it's a new combination of thinking. Yeah. It's the combination of Einstein's three sphere, Robertson Walker, Noether, uh, and, and Minkowski in time. That combination is unique. That's the one that's certainly unique that I've never seen any other group or university have even having thought of. But I think we've got enough observational proof to be cocky about it and say that we know best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 When, you, <clears throat> when I look at the graph of the University of Amsterdam, you can see this. Uh, it is. Yeah, we did that one. Yeah, 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 I'll get back to it. Um, that more or less means that we observe the whole universe, and the, the, the observable universe is the Good same point. as the whole universe. This is the. This is it? Well, okay. Yeah, the uh, what what we claim that we now actually see almost all of the universe, yeah. because we we. Uh, um, uh, Oscar reminded me that no, GNZ 11 is not the farthest galaxy. There are a few even farther nowadays, but 92% uh, of the distance alone is seeing as good as everything of the universe. So yes, what we see is, what we can see is all what we can see in the universe. But it's quite a big statement as well. It is a big statement. It's yeah. a big, see the, um, all other theories have a horizon problem. Yeah because they don't understand how that expansion and, and does light go faster than light <laughs> kind of questions. We don't have those questions. We have an horizon and the horizon is the other side and it fits all beautifully with what we know and what we observe. Any other questions? Yeah, I want. Uh, did you confront uh, the University of Amsterdam, uh, the results they presented with your uh, theory? Uh, yes, Mr. He came for a presentation and Martin was there too. And he said, relativity, that's old fashioned. We don't do that. And it is important to understand that all the people that knew relativity a little bit are now retired. It's all gray haired people like myself. You don't see many professors that know anything about relativity anymore. It is an old fashioned theory. But many of them think it's completed, done and dusted, and that it could not be finished. We are working hard to go to the next step and combine Einstein's relativity with M. Neuter's conservation model. So, uh, in essence, there's nobody, even for example in the M87 club, where loads of people are working on the black hole in the M87 galaxy, they s make statements about relativity that Schwarzschild has said or Einstein has said that aren't even true anymore, but they copy, 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 and they end up in a new kind of reality of relativity, which is quite mysterious. And if you like mystery, it's fine, but if you go back to the hard physics of the original authors, uh, we are way out there. 
we go by the original statements, energy conservation, that's all gone. So in Amsterdam, they're not saying, wow, nice, they're saying, we're not dealing with relativity anymore. And these kind of things like galaxy distribution, uh, no, no answer. But the University of Amsterdam has to admit as well that, that we see the, the whole universe. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that, as I see it, universities that respond uh, need to do something with that information. And if that puts you as a total outlier of all other universities, they, what I find quite ex extremely brave of that university that dares to say dark energy is in error. So the only place we could possibly go to, and not so fortunate at the moment, is <laughs> that Yonsei, where they actually dare to question dark energy, dark energy in error. All other universities, come up with that same faulty model, that house of cards that doesn't fit observations. And I can't help that. It's yeah. the advantage of us as independent thinkers that we can say these things and we can record these things, but they have the right to ignore it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for listening to us, us listening to us. Uh, it's been a great time. Thank you. Thank you.